I grew up in a cult. If you go back on my channel, you will see way back. And I can talk about it. I talk about it. But it takes so much for me to talk about it. It's it's like all I can talk about at that moment. I can't do anything else. I can barely function when I talk about it. I grew up in a cult. I was raised to believe that these people were my family. They were not. We, we were not blood related. The abuse that happened to me, you know what abuse I'm talking about. Start with an S, you know, with an X, in the middle, L, on the end, okay? All that abuse was from blood-related people. The physical abuse happened from blood-related people and also people who were in this cult family. And it was all okay by a blood-related family member, okay? So if that makes any sense to you, great. If it doesn't, I'm not going to get too much into it right now. That's why I write a lot, and that's why I have my blog, uh, because it's easier for me to write. I've always been a writer since I was very young. Uh, poetry, short stories, long stories, because I've always, like I said, been trying to make sense out of all of these things, okay? And writing helps me think. And when I can't figure stuff out, when it's too overwhelming, then I have math, I have my physical activities, because before I knew that what was happening, I'm going to get back to the mind-body connection. It's, it's, it's going to be, makes sense, just rock with me on this one. If you can, if you can't, I understand, just take care of yourself mentally and physically. When, because I didn't understand that the abuse was abuse, okay? When, when I would go over to the abuser's house at the age of six, I would go into the room willingly. Like I said, this might be too triggering for some people. If, if it's too triggering for you, I'm begging you not to watch this, okay? Because for me, it's a lot. So for somebody else, I can imagine it will maybe a lot for you. I would willingly go in. Once I got older, and I realized that this person who was at that point probably six times older than me should not have been doing the things they were doing to me. That's when it, excuse my language, but I'm going to say it's my channel and it's my experience. So if you don't like swear words, you shouldn't watch my video either. Um, it fucked me up because I knew that I had willingly gone in there. Um, so when I realized what happened, I went to another family member, the family member that I told you that okay it, me going, me being beaten by other people, all this, and they said I was lying, okay? Um, the thing about my brain is that the way I remember things, um, and I don't want to say like I'm incapable of lying. It's just that my brain is very honest. Like if, if I can make that make sense to someone, like the way I remember things so well, and I have a very strong olfactory sense. So like I can be triggered by smells and it's like, like as if I have taken a time travel machine and go back to it. I knew I wasn't lying. Someone else in my family who this had also happened to knew I wasn't lying, but we were children. And there is only so much you can do. With the physical abuse, I can I can talk about the, for me talking about physical abuse and it's easier than talking about the other one because physically I've gotten more control over my body. Like, and I do that through dance and through exercise and through body movement. So I've learned how to like, kind of like get my control back. And that's why it's also very triggering when I was uh, wild camping. And then uh, one of the people in the restaurant asked me if I wanted tea, I said yes. And then they assaulted me on my butt and on my beer shoulder. So it's very triggering for me um, when the lady when I was in Schroeder, Alabama in the mountains and the lady just came into my room and laid on top of me because she was worried about me and triggering. 
and people think all the time, well, touch, I'm just touching you because of, like, you don't have to touch someone to show kindness or care or concern. I personally don't like people touching me. I don't think it's a, a symbol of care or concern, nothing. Even me, when I want to hug somebody, I give them a warning. Like, I'll open my arms. I just don't grab them. I'll open my arms, and I'll stand there. And if they want to hug, they come in. If they don't, then most people, because I read energies, I don't open my arms to hug somebody unless I'm getting the vibe that you, you want to hug. Other people, they like, tend not to do that with me. They just think it's okay to grab me. It's not. And I would, like, behoove other people. If you're, I'm going to make a separate video about this, but if your love language, and that's fine, I don't have an issue with your love language, with people's love language being touched, with individual love language being touched, but it's not okay for me. It's too triggering for me, and there's nothing I can do about that. It's from my past, it's I can't be touched without my consent. Nobody should be touched without their consent, but when I get touched without my consent, it sends me to a whole nother place. It's like I'm a totally different person. It's it's bad. It's very bad for me. Yeah. And I've learned how to control my responses and my reactions, but it takes a lot of strength and a lot of energy for me to do that. And I just don't feel the need to have to go through life like that because it's a very miserable existence for me to have to constantly be doing like this all the time. It's too much. Yeah. And people should just learn, like, don't put your hands on somebody else. Like, even if you mean it in a good way, you know how they say, like, good intentions yeah good intentions are only that if they don't land properly and if they, the, the result is not received well your good intentions are not so good maybe yeah anyway so when as i got older and as i realized what was wrong because like i said growing up in a cult it's a very secluded we were allowed to go to public school we went to public school but uh, the people who were my abusers also worked in these schools. Every school I went to, one or more of them worked in these schools. And that's how they maintained order and maintained control. Everything is documented. And I have this thing where I feel like I need to prove myself to people. I do not, because I'm talking to myself right now. But people seem to feel like they have no idea how traumatizing and triggering it is for someone to talk about such an abusive past. I'm talking about it because talking about it helps me, but also I know there are other people out there struggling. There are other people out there dealing with S-U-I-C, I-V-A-L, ideations and dealing with it on a daily basis. I still deal with it even now as I'm almost 50 years old and I still deal with it like sometimes daily, now daily. That's why I'm doing these videos because I'm basically talking to myself, but I hope it helps other people. Um, so when, when you, when, when I started understanding things and when I really started understanding things, it re-triggered me. It was a, and I didn't know what to do. Yeah. Because I'm thinking I'm this nasty, bad person who's like having this relationship with someone that I'm related to. And I beat myself up for years about it, like years. The issue is, is that at times I'm still beating myself up about it. And I'm not going to get into it right now because it's, I haven't figured out how to deal with it and how to like live with this past. I don't know. Uh, but I'm learning and I really need to make a separate video because although I'm not one of those type of people who would like would be like please watch my video because this is not the type of video that I wish everybody would watch this type of video is specifically made for people who are like me like people who have gone through this abuse and for me, it was very severe because it happened at an extremely young age and it continued on for years. Um, and that's the main reason I ran away from home at 17. Um, so, like, I wish people like me, you know, CSA survivors, 
could hear this video because I, I wish, I don't necessarily wish someone had said it for me to me because there are other people who haven't gone through that who also can tell you like, heal yourself and all these things are also very useful for, for someone in my position. In. But I'm making these videos specifically for those type of individuals. If somebody else gets it, my thing is I don't want to traumatize somebody or make somebody feel sad. Like I don't ever want to do that. That's not ever something that I and you know, people going around saying they're intimidated by me. That's your problem. Like, that's really not my issue. I know who I am. And if you're intimidated by me, that's something that that you never need to deal with yourself. But my intention is never to like uh, make someone feel bad. You know, uh, I'm going to tell you the truth. And if that makes you feel bad, I don't know what to tell you. I'm still going to say it, even if I know you don't like think it's the truth. Like, I'll, I'll give you a warning and say I'm getting ready to tell you the truth like I did in this video, but I'm not going to like not say what needs to be said because you know. so one way I begin to deal with um, the understanding of the truth of what happened and like even though I was a child and I didn't know, but the part that I physically played in it, it was so much for me that my mind and my body went, they, they went, I'll see you, see you later, I'll see you later. Um, okay. That's what happened. And even now, like I said, almost 50 years old, it's still happening. The, the shutting off is still happening. So when someone does, that's why people don't understand and they, like people have called me so many names, crazy, like recently I heard crazy, uh, weird, uh, bizarre, uh, uh, terrible, all these, okay, whatever their labels are, maybe that's how they see themselves, I don't know. Um, but the thing about it is, What's strange, what's crazy, what's weird, what's bizarre is my childhood. And that's why it's so dangerous and so monumental when abuse occurs in childhood. By no means am I diminishing the intensity of abuse at any stage in life. Absolutely not. I am saying that when someone is abused as a child, it sets you. It's like, here, this is the concrete, and you're set in it. And your whole life is you chipping away at this concrete, trying to get out. And then for a long time, your head is sticking out, but your body is in. So you're one person, but your body is having a whole nother experience in this life than your head and your mind. If that makes sense, that's like how the mind-body connection is. Okay? I'm just looking to see what time it is because I want to make this a short so people can understand. Okay. So, I learned how to like have these lives and scenarios in my head they can sort of like insulate me from things that were happening and kind of like give me a better experience than my body had and was having to this day i don't really have relationships like i've been celibate for eight years now and when i did have sexual relations with someone uh, it wasn't very long and it was very, uh, the last one actually wasn't toxic. It for a little bit in the beginning, it was, uh, but I try to, like, I know that me being in a relationship will not be like a normal average everyday thing. I try to like, when I, I always approach the person like usually because I watch and I see and I look and I say, is this the type of person that like is for me? And 
if I think, I will approach the person. Uh, most of the time, they look at me like I'm crazy. And, you know, uh, I've gotten no's. Okay. Um, and for me, I used to think, oh, wow, well, like, I'm going to live the rest of my life alone. Like, I'm never going to have anybody in my life. And then I kind of accepted that and I kind of would just go through life and keep traveling with, at that time, it's just my daughter, uh, I traveled with her and homeschooled her. So I was just like, okay, I have a daughter, so I need to focus on that anyway, it's forever. Um, but then during different times, I would be like, oh yeah, I kind of want to be in there, kind of my kind of relationship because I'm, I'm, I know the relationship in my head that I want, so it's here. Uh, so I look for that in other people. And if I see it and I'm like, oh, wow, there it is. And then it's not. Okay. And so then I'm just like, okay, whatever. But I'm very cautious, like who I share my body with, because I don't, people think I'm extremely promiscuous because I twerk, I dance, I, I do Tai Chi and I can do it in the nude or not. It's, 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 and I heal my chi and stuff. So people think, oh, I'm just going out here sleeping with everyone when I'm not. And I find that very like discomforting and reassuring at the same time. It's discomforting because I, I know that's the type of where I live in and it makes me very sad. Uh, and it also is reassuring for me because it lets me know that living my life in isolation is what I should be. But, you know, it's not that, like, I remember I was dating this guy and I found out later that behind my back, this, I was like barely 20 at the time. I found out uh, later he was talking about me, you know, behind my back. Uh, telling people I was crazy because I had shared with him like some of the things I'm sharing with you in this video. And that's what I used to do. Like, I didn't even know how to be in a relationship. Like, as soon as I would meet somebody because I wanted that, that healthy connection so bad, I would just share everything. All the abuse that happened to me as a child, I would just, I would share it because I wanted somebody to like be there. And I wanted somebody to like be there with me through the thick and the thin and the bad and the good and like still want to be with me after that. And all I was doing or all that was happening was people was running for the heels, okay? So I was like, okay, something must be wrong with me. And then the like the S-U-I-C-I-D thoughts, well, S-U-I-C-I-D-A-L thoughts, they would ramp up because I was like, what's the point of me being here if I'm going to be alone? And then life happens, and I started realizing, like I said, now I'm almost 50 years old, and I started realizing that it's okay if you don't have someone like in your life. If, if that's how, it's a little bit sad. If you, it's a little bit sad if you if you go to your favorite restaurant and you get the same meal all the time. You go there and they say oh, we can't serve. Yeah, you're a little bit sad. This that kind of sad. It's a little bit sad, yes. But I also know. And this the real hard, honest truth that for me to be mentally healthy, I need to be alone a lot. Like for me to stay mentally healthy, I need to be alone a lot. And if I'm going to be in a relationship, I know that for a lot of people, that's not something they want. Maybe it's not even something they need. I don't know. But I'm not going to settle on that. I know myself. I know my mental state. I know like where I am on the mental health scale. And so I need the, that time of isolated reflection and introspection all the time. I can be with people for a certain amount of time and then I have to pull back. I've tried the constantly social. I've tried to live. I've tried all the different ways that I possibly can. And for me, the most optimal, the most ideal, the most mentally healthy is when I spend majority of my time by myself. A lot of people don't understand that. I'm not interested in a lot of people. I'm only interested in the people who are for me. So, and I had to learn that that's okay because all my life up until the point that I started realizing that it, 
this drunk. All my life, I thought you have to belong to a group. You have to be in, in, included in something. You have to be, you have to. And if you're not, something's wrong with you. But I was fucking myself up mentally. What I kept hearing was fucking me up mentally. And I could never heal. I could never, it, could, it was always open scar, open scar, open scar. Because I kept, you know, thinking. Oh my God, something's wrong with me because I'm by myself. And then I would keep trying to connect with people. But what the problem was, I never learned how to connect with people. Because like I told you before, I grew up in a cult. I was inside of that cult. I was abused. When I left the cult, I was abused. Then I went back to the cult because I left the cult from the age of six to seven and a half. It's, I talked about it before. Is anyone saying it? Uh, Long story short, the person who birthed me said they didn't want to be around me because I was always sad. I didn't know at that time that I was already mentally fucked up. I went to a therapist later. My therapist told me, like later, like decades later, and my therapist told me that actually, because she can't, you can't diagnose somebody with having me in there. But from what I explained to her from my childhood, she said that most likely that the person who birthed me also had mental illness. So like... <laughs> The blind leading the blind is not, you know, unless one of y'all can get a little bit of sight somehow, it's not going to work. So I had to learn how to deal with that. Then when I was seven and a half, the person who birthed me, uh, I call her the egg. I don't call her my mother because she wasn't my mother to me. But the egg brought me back uh, and I uh, stayed in that cult and then until I ran away at seven. Uh, so, yeah. Um, so when people call me weird and bizarre and crazy, uh, at this point in my life, I kind of just hunch my shoulders and most of the time I don't even hunch my shoulders anymore because for me to be at this point and for me to be here alive, appearing crazy to you, it's a good thing for me because I'm blessed to be crazy. I could be dead. I could be on drugs. Uh, I'm not. So, like, um, this weird, bizarre, crazy, ludicrous, like, impossible person. Yeah, you're right. I am an impossible person because everything in my life was meant to try to kill me, was meant to try to unalive me, as people say these days, was meant to try to stop me in some kind of way and even though i'm crazy to you guys because i have the tattoos here and you know you everyone keep a lot of people keep asking me if i'm a man or a woman and all this dumb this dumb shit because that's what it is because i don't know how any of my personal business is relevant to strangers on the street but i live um because i'm definitely not asking you questions about your personal life because i really do not want to know if you are in my tribe and if you are one of the people who I'm supposed to travel this journey with, you tell me whatever you want. But just some random person on the street trying to be in my business or I'm in their business doesn't serve me, doesn't interest me in the least. Um, so anyway, the fact that I'm still here with all these mental illnesses, and I have them. I don't lie about my mental illnesses. A lot of people think like, well, don't don't tell people, don't don't be public about your mental illnesses. It's like if you want to lie or or not be truthful about yourself, or and or simply if you feel shame about the truth of yourself, that's on you. I pray that you do not. I don't feel shame when it comes to my mental illnesses, and I say mine because this is my journey, my life. Mental illness one, two, and three are here with me, and we go through life together. Uh, you know, it is what it is. I try to stay at the captain's film as much as I can, but sometimes they are there, you know, swerving and curving. Uh, it is what it is, you know? Um, the way I stay, <laughs> you know, at the wheel is by staying alone a lot of the time. And people say, well, you're probably going to die alone. I'm, I'm not understanding how you're, how that's supposed to be seen as a threat. Um, if I'm at my most mentally healthy alone, then I'm okay with that. Like, I talk very openly how I express myself sexually as a celibate individual. 
And so I still express myself sexually. It's just that I don't express myself sexually with another person. Uh, I'm not close to the idea, but I'm not, I'm also not open to accepting anyone. I'm open to accepting the person for me, period. And as a child, I wasn't taught that. I only learned that as an adult, as an almost 50 year old adult. I only learned that recently, like in the last five to 10 years. So I'm going to end this video now because I really want to eat my food. <laughs> and I'm going to make shorts from this video, just so you know. And hopefully, for all my fellow CSA survivors, I'm praying for I'm praying for everybody because I want everybody to live and to not to live in these in these prisons of this of your mind of your body none of that. But in reality, like I know that's not reality. And I wish I pray for everyone to find their purpose, for everyone to find those things that make them the most mentally well, the most mentally okay with themselves. And I pray that for myself and for everybody. And this mind body disconnect thing, sometimes we got to look at it as like a good thing because it helps us get through the trauma. But we need to have these safe spaces so that we can begin to heal and heal as much as we can, okay? It's not a cure. The mind-body disconnect is not a cure. There is no cure. The only way you can cure it is to erase yourself from the past. And I don't know if you, if you can do that. I don't even know if that would work. So like, but you can heal. Like I have begun my healing and I'm, that's why I'm sharing this video. These, I'm sharing myself with others and sharing my life and my experiences so that if you are going through this thing or if, or if you know someone who seems weird and bizarre and off, maybe they had a fucked up childhood and they trying to, Go through life, figure out how to what's the word I'm looking for? Not traverse through life, but how to I know the word. I know the word. They're trying to figure out how to just get through this. I want to say mitigate, but eh, they're trying to figure out things. They're trying to figure out how to find their place in life, how to find their place and their purpose and how to not every day have to relive that trauma, even though it comes whenever it wants sometimes, the memories and shit. So please, before you out there judging people, first of all, it's really none of our places to be judging anybody, okay? And before you out there pointing fingers at people, how about work, work on your own mental health? Because even if you haven't had a fucked up childhood, you still need to work on your mental health. Shit, these working 60, 70 hours per week out here, crazy, going into places, acting like a fool, worry about your mental health as well. And worry, then maybe that will make you more compassionate when you see someone else and you want to label them something in your mind that's negative. Maybe if you would focus on like the healing of yourself, and make sure you're okay mentally. Maybe you wouldn't be so quick to judge other people because you really don't know what other people have gone through and are going through in the moment you decide to drop your unwanted two cents in their lives, okay? So I love all y'all, even the ones who out here being judgmental as fuck. Be blessed, okay? And I'm praying for everybody. I'm praying just for us. And bye. Ciao for now, y'all. Toodles.